Hey guys, welcome to another episode on TFB TV. We really want to thank Venture Munitions for helping to sponsor some of these episodes and helping to get the kinds of equipment and stuff that we need to keep it going. Today, we're going to be talking about the crank. This wasn't a quantum leap in small arms design. This didn't, you know, change the battlefield. This didn't, uh, this didn't win a war. This didn't, this didn't really, this honestly didn't have any very big tangible difference on anything in the world. Um, military history wise or small arms design either. It, it is a little bit monumental because it was the first eight inch uh, barrel AK in that was mass produced and you know this led to later stuff down the line where we see a lot of short barreled AKs today throughout the world. This was the first one. You know, did it inspire it? Maybe not, who cares? Um, that stuff was probably gonna come along anyways. Everything that is wrapped around this thing the name, the culture, the use of it today, and for, to me the biggest thing is some of the misconceptions around it and some of the stuff that just gets uh, completely changed out. I mean, everything from the very name itself, Crink, Crinkoff, and we'll go over that in a second, to things like, you know, it had this like crazy briefcase that was kind of like the Soviet version of the MP5 briefcase that was used where you could actually put the thing in it. How this thing came about is, this is where sort of the misconceptions begin. In that everyone, th like the common misconception is that this was, you know, a commando rifle. It was meant for commandos. It was meant for Spetsnaz. It was developed for Spetsnaz and all this other stuff. And no, it wasn't. Um, this came out in the mid 1970s. There's an earlier project that actually came out before it, which was chambered in a different caliber, um, which was sort of actually a handheld submachine gun slash rifle thing. Um, that came out. And the inspiration for, in the 1970s, a trial for the AKS-74U um, was sort of that earlier project and that this was there, there was a pre-project that, that came along. But what this was originally for, the, the stipulations for the operational requirements for the AKS-74U was after the um, AK-74 came out. So it had to be chambered in 545. But this was meant as a rifle for soldiers whose primary job occupation having a rifle would hinder them. So when I talk about that, I mean RPG gunners, I mean vehicle crewmen, I mean radio operators. This was not for special operations to begin with. It wasn't for it whatsoever. Later on down the line that got tacked on, but this was not for, uh, this was not specifically made for Spetsnaz. There was actually a bunch of different contestants that came in and narrowed down to about four or five, a number of different ones. Some of them were actually really neat to look at. It's like, man, why didn't that stuff work? Kalashnikov came up with one. Um, I think Dragunov came up with another. A couple others came with one. There's even a bulb up one that was invented. Um, it entered field trials in 77, 78 in what is currently Azerbaijan. Um, outside of the capital of Baku. Um, it was field trial there for a while, it was adopted in 79. Soviets invaded Afghanistan in December of 1979. And that's when things really kick off with this thing. In that there were bits and pieces of this that were made for Spetsnaz use, right? And this is where I have this 20 round magazine to show you for comparison. And that you see sometimes see this guy, especially in the artillery museum in St. Petersburg, um, it's outfitted with you know a PBS-1 suppressor, it's outfitted with a scope, a night optic, outfitted with a grenade launcher and all this other stuff, and it has a 20 round magazine. Um, to be honest, the Soviets never really used 20 rounders, ever. They never really mass produced these things. Other countries did, but the Soviets didn't. So. Afghanistan rolls around, right? Soviets are fighting the Mujahideen over the, over the next decade. The thing is, Spetsnaz guys did take a look at it and they did take a look at fielding it. And there might have been some isolated use here and there, but for the most part, Spetsnaz wanted nothing to do with this thing. The reason why is because the combat engagement distances in the Soviet Afghan war were over 300 meters. They were over long, long distances. This is a 100, 200 meter problem solver. This is not a 300, 400, 500 meter, you know, Marine Corps rifle KD range hitting targets out to 500. So the Spetsnaz didn't want it. They wanted AK-74. So who did want it though? Well, the, so the rank and file, a lot of the rank and file soldiers didn't want it either because a lot of their problems were 400, 500, 600 meter problems. This does nothing for you. 
This does nothing for you at that range. We got it instead, and we see a lot of photographs of it doing the war, is we see a lot of vehicle guys getting it. We see hind crewmen, we see uh, tank crewmen, we see BMP crewmen often carrying these things. And what they would want this for, and what you'd often see them with, is you'd often see them with either 30 rounders, you know, taped together like this, so you have two 30 rounders right there, or you even see examples of cranks with 45, a 45 round magazine. But the reason for this, remember what I said, this is a 100, 200 meter problem solver, right? As a tank crewman or as a hind crewman, if your vehicle is out of action and you're shot down or you're surrounded by Mujahideen and they're running all up on over you, you want something that you can easily get out of the confined space. You know, even if we have say a 45 rounder in here, you want something you can easily get out of a confined space of a tank or of a hind, you know, pop over the side of it like this and just go to town. Because that's what this excelled at. It was small and it was short. In fact, the Soviets, for the hind pilots, they even designed a special system to use it. So hind pilots were actually carrying this thing on their thigh with a specially designed holster. And they even had a magazine pouch on their on their vest with a holster with a holster for a magazine for a 30 round magazine in it which by the way a lot of the helicopter pilots from what we've read in our primary sources is that a lot of the pilots didn't actually like it at all it wasn't very it wasn't very long lived and it was quickly discarded and you don't see pilots with it towards the end of the war the beginning of the war you do but this leads to where we get the name Krinkov and this is what I love about it, because with the stuff I study, with looking at stuff in Pashto, stuff in Farsi, stuff in Arabic, Krinkov, we see, comes from Afghan Mujahideen in the eastern part of Afghanistan toward in the beginning of the war. How do we know this? So here's the other thing, is that Krink, we see a resurgence of the, we see a resurgence of the weapon system in the 1990s in the United States, and it really starts taking off in the, 19, in the 2000s. Um, the first big thing we see of the AKS-74 for you is a guy named Paul Mahoney who owned a shop named Crinks in the mid-90s in Florida. From what we know of, his rifles really weren't the best quality in the world, but guess what? He was, the only, he was one of the only guys who was building American AKs um, out of parts kits in the U.S., and he made short barrel variants, and he called his shop Crinks. Um, later on, we see this explode to the point where we come up across this guy named Blue Jack. All right, so... Just to backtrack a little bit, crink barrels, AKS-74U barrels, eight and a half inch barrels, have a special twist rate because for, to stabilize the 545 round in an eight and a half inch barrel, if you're shooting it at a target, a standard AK-74 twist rate is not going to work. The bullets are starting to be keyholing. So a lot of guys who are building crink builds as either pistols or SBRs were finding out that if they just chopped the 74 barrel, stuck it in here and made it work, the rounds would keyhole, wouldn't be accurate. Interestingly enough, there's a guy who was in New York and has a foreign, had a, a guy was in New York and he had an account that was based out of West Virginia and contracted with a company in Montana and contracted with them to make barrels. And you have this, these blue jack barrels. He stopped in about 2014, 2013 production kind of stopped. But when that was going on, a lot of American gun owners were buying Blue Jack barrels. And you'd had different versions, like a Blue Jack V1, Blue Jack V2, Blue Jack V3, V4, 5, or something like that. And as, you know, as the versions got higher, you know, each barrel run got better because they were making them to better spec. Um, right now, it's almost impossible to find a Blue Jack barrel, especially one that is in the white, um, hasn't been used, and is a virgin barrel. It's very difficult to find. But the reason why you need to find these barrels is because a lot of the parts kits that came into the States, the Tula parts kits, some of them came in without barrels. So, so we see more Bulgarian parts kits that come in, of the Bulgarian variant of the AKS-74U with barrels. That's another different story, and Bulgarian barrels will work in a Russian 74. The difference between the Bulgarian and then the Russian safe 74 pattern is that the Bulgarian copies a post-86 crank. The, so in the Soviet Union, you had uh, pre-86, which you could easily identify by having two holes in two vents in the handguard. Um, post-86 crinks don't have those holes. They took them away. So we have crink as an American term, but then we have crink off. 
the first point, so people will say like, oh, maybe like the name came from, like maybe they captured it from a Russian officer and his name was Krinkov. Uh, wrong. The name Krinkov doesn't exist in Russian, nor did any Soviet soldiers ever call this a uh, Krinkov. In fact, they called this a Katsua or Kasia or something, which was uh, essentially like a little bitch because it was like, a, 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 you know, it's a little bitch. What can I say? Um, but what happens is where we first hear of it, is in the Soldier of Fortune issue of July 1984. And in it, we have Soft Exclusive AKR by David Isby. Soft Scoop CIA, Scoop CIA, Field Test Mysterious, Krinkov, right? So he goes in it, which by the way, this not Nomiker, the AKR, as you can see. AKR we see in the earlier part of the war and we see it being used by mostly Western slash NATO um, conglomerate countries um, in the Intel community. And we see it as the AKS-74U being referred to as the AKR. This designation AKR goes on until like the mid 90s or something like that. And then just kind of fades away. Just kind of just looking at Jane's reference manuals and books and stuff like that just kind of goes away. We think one idea for the AKR might have come from this guy, a guy named Viktor Suvorov, who, that's not actually his real name, it's actually a pseudonym, he's a Soviet defector, he entered, uh, in, entered into Western Europe at the beginning of the Afghan war, and we see references to him and AKR, so that is a possible explanation of the word AKR came from, but regardless, we have this AKR thing, it's being referred to as AKR, it does not get referred to as AKR after the 1990s. Where it comes from, it might have came from this guy, he might have said, yeah, this is a new Soviet, you know, submachine gun rifle combo, like this is our new AKR. But in this article that we talk about, the Krink, we have several names. We have, he mentions, the AKR's designation is uncertain and passes by a variety of nicknames, Krinkov, Shinkov, and Shishkov. So that's interesting because recently when I was in Kabul, I, I oh when I'm ever meeting Afghans, I always like to show them a picture of a crank and I say like, what do you call this gun? So recently in Kabul, I showed this to this private security guard and I showed this picture of a crank and I was like, what do you call this gun? And he specifically said, this is a shrinkoff. Now, and he, I asked him like, no, 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 like a crinkoff? And he looked at me like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Like this is a shrinkoff right here. And I'm like, okay. So there's some people who actually call it shrinkoff. So we have this sort of division where we have crinkoff and shrinkoff as well. The majority of Afghans and Pakistanis, especially those in KPK and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, where a lot of these are made in Dara, um, will call them crinkoffs, right? So the majority name crinkoff is sort of taking over. And we have Pakistanis and we have we have mostly well, mostly Pashtuns who, you know, never watched any sort of like, you know, never been they don't know English, they haven't been in endued with any sort of Western firearms literature whatsoever, and they're calling this thing Krinkov. Alright? And that's very very good. Another name that we see is Kalikov. This is not a Kalikov. Within Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or Afghanistan, a Kalikov will be in reference to a full stock AK-74. This is not a Kalikov. This is a Krinkov or a Shrinkov. And we see that there. So w the name we know for sure wasn't used by 1984. To bring this sort of in circle, in a circle here, we know that a lot of the vehicle guys had this. A lot of the Hind guys had this. A lot of the tank guys had this. A lot of the BMP guys had this. So why it became special within Afghanistan and afterwards, one conclusion that we've come up with is that if you're, you know, if you're Abdullah Mujahid and you, know, you shoot down a hind with your stinger or something, and you run up to that hind, to the, to the wreckage, and da-da-da, and if you're able to pull one of these bad boys out of there, you can show this to all your buddies and be like, look, dude, I've got a crink off. And the only way, one of the only ways you could get this, of, of course, we know there's a lot of diversion doing the Soviet-Afghan war. There's a lot of corrupt Afghan army officers. There's issues with Soviet stockpiles being diverted, Mujahideen buying them, this, that, and other. So, of course, there are ways that people could get this, you know, um, nefariously. However, if you did get it out of a helicopter crash, and you showed it to your buds, and you're like, look, dude, I got this crank. They would all know, like, wow, the only, one of the only ways you can get that thing is if you pulled it out of a smoldering hind helicopter or a smoldering BMP. So it's sort of like a trophy at that point. The other aspect of this is that it's a short-barreled rifle. And short-barreled rifles in any connotation, in any place, are usually always valued 
especially by folks who are always on the move, moving here, moving there. You know, it's it's lightweight, it's short, you know, it doesn't take up much space, but yet you still have all this firepower that you had at the time. It's like you could lug around an AK an AKM or AK forty seven at the time, or you could lug around this, which is weighs almost nothing compared to the other the other weapon systems, right? Now this is where we sort of see this cult leadership thing developed around this guy. And we see this, we see this during the war. We have um, we have pictures of Ahmad Shah Massoud, um, you know, firing this thing. And it was very specific that he had it. Um, we've got other pictures of Afghan Mujahideen leaders that also carried it, and they carried it very specifically. Um, we even have pictures going into this day of Afghan leaders today that are still carrying this thing as a status symbol. So a recent example was Rashid Dustam. He was the former pro vice president of Afghanistan. There's, there's pictures of his sons walking around with it. His bodyguards have it. Um, there's another, there's this Afghan warlord who ran into Kabul and, you know, the, there's a big brouhaha over it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but he had it and he was pictured with it. And then outside of Afghanistan, we see this emulation of the crink starting to push all over the place. Example number, the biggest example you've probably seen is Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden would always be pictured with things. There's an article on TFB that you can actually read about Osama bin Laden's crinks where we kind of go through back and forth and see what he had. And it looks like he actually had two. And he would actually rotate between them. And you can look at the kinds of handguards on there. And it looked like he just held them aside and like, okay, yeah, get me one of the crinks on. Because in one picture, you see that he has them. You see pictures of Osama bin Laden like with his crink like off to the side of this in you know, his public speech or you know, his, in his propaganda videos. That was very deliberate. That was absolutely 100% deliberate because people would see the crink. Maybe they wouldn't understand what he's talking about, but especially people who understood this, they'd see it as a power item, a status tool, and they'd be like, okay, wow, he's got the crink on there. He must be someone important. We even see the crink as far west as Lebanon, where we see a bodyguard of a prominent mullah um, specifically using crinks. Um, in Yemen, for example, we even have examples of crinks being sold for sale and they're known as the Jafri. But if you look on Yemeni social media and you'll see stuff like, hey, Jafri for sale, you know, 50,000 Saudi rials. And they're talking about the crink. We also see it referred to as the Osama gun or the Osama bin Laden gun in a lot of these other places.